Hey guys, it's Chris here for The Process. Today's episode, we're gonna get nitty gritty. We're gonna get into the minutia and the details, and we're gonna talk about mindset and what you need to do to overcome the power that money has over you. But before we do all that stuff, I'm gonna introduce our new co-host. She's an amazing person, and I'm excited to do that with you right now, so stick around. Who's this person sitting to my, my right? This is Melinda Lipsy, and she's a practicing graphic designer. We're gonna get into her story, and then we're gonna jump into her question. Okay, so you've been out of school now for something like nine years, if I got that right, and seven of which you worked in-house as a graphic designer, mm -hmm. on and off. Where did you work at? What did you do? That kind of thing. Um, I worked at a large eyewear company in the action sports industry. And so I first started out working in the um, graphics department doing marketing and advertising. And then later I went into the branding department. We worked on product graphics and in-store graphics, retail displays, and packaging. How did you get this job? I originally got it from a portfolio review oh. at an AIGA event, the portfolio review, and I got picked up there as an intern. And that started my career. And did that happen while you were still in school or after you finished school? Yes, it happened when I was still in school about two months before I graduated. Oh, perfect timing then. Mm -hmm. Okay, so doing the portfolio reviews can be helpful. Becoming part of the AIG can, AIGA can be helpful. Mm -hmm. And that led you to get an internship, and after you finished the internship, how long was the internship? Uh, the internship lasted probably about six months. Okay, it's a longer on the mm -hmm. internship side. And then you, did you get a job offer right after that? I got... Um, full-time freelance from there, and they were trying to put me into a full-time position, so that's why the internship took longer, too, because they, they were waiting to hire me on. Okay, that's great. So you're taking little steps towards getting the ultimate goal, which is to secure a full-time job mm -hmm. with your degree in design. Mm -hmm. Now, you went to Cal State Fullerton, yes. and what did you study there? I studied graphic design and illustration. And. What drew you to go to Cal State Fullerton? It's not exactly like the mecca for graphic design education, right? Right. And yeah. I hope I'm not offending everybody when I say that, but there's a handful of schools that you know about that always come up in terms of where you should go for graphic design. That's not one of them. That's not to say it's a bad school. I'm not trying to throw judgment on anybody and get all snooty on anybody, but why did you go there? I went there out of convenience sake. <coughs> I lived very close there and I originally didn't apply there for the graphic design program. I fell into the graphic design program. That's a double whammy. You went there for convenience sake and you didn't even pick it, you just kind of fell into it. Yes. But I'm sure that's gonna to relate to a lot of people who are watching this right now. It's like, yeah, maybe that sounds like you, I don't know. And I chose you very specifically to be on this show because I think you're perfectly positioned from somebody who maybe you went to a second or third tier school, studied graphic design, but that wasn't the hot burning thing that you knew you wanted to do until you did it. And you've been in house and now you're on your own. So this is a perfect opportunity for us to answer a lot of the questions that people might have that are in your shoes right now. Mm -hmm. Should we jump into it? Yes. All right, what's, your, uh, what's the question you have for me? Uh, I'd like to start off with getting clients. So everybody wants to get clients. I know. Well, I do. I do get a good amount of clients that keep me busy. Mm -hmm. But there are times where I have to answer the phones. I have to filter the clients and see if they can afford me. But I don't always have the time and resources to take away from the time that I'm working on projects with clients to then getting new business. Okay. Let me get into some diagnostic things. Now, those of you guys that are watching right now, I want you to get a piece of paper or something and take some notes because I'm going to ask Melinda these questions and then you can write them down and play along, okay? So let's go. All right. You're working. So how many hours a week are you working on average? On admin and client work or would you say on the actual project? On the actual projects. Like what's taking up all your time? I would say about um, if I'm working roughly 40 hours a week, then 30 for going to project work. Okay. And the other 10 is going to admin or? Admin, phone calls. Um, phone calls. What, what do you mean? Who are you calling? Incoming clients. So people New biz? Who, 
Yes. All right. So how much time are you spending a week doing dealing with new biz inquiries? Being that this is a brand new person that you don't even know about. Okay. Brand new people. I, I yeah. get at least two to three inquiries. You do? That's, a, that's pretty good. Some, I mean, it's feast or famine. Sometimes it's that much. It could be sometimes crickets. it's zero for three weeks. Okay. But when it's an average good week, then... Yeah, I'm talking about average. So average. we lop off the high and the low, right? Okay, if we're doing <clears throat> average. I believe that's what we said at the beginning of the show. <laughs> Let's go with one inquiry a week. Would that's be. still good. Yeah. So one new business inquiry a week. Are they calling you up? Are they sending you an email? How are they reaching out to you? They're both. I get text, email, and calls. Text? Yes. People have your cell phone number? They do because it's normally referrals. So it's a family member is referred then, they just give them my phone number and they probably say, go shoot her a text. Um, I get emails and most of my clients come from referrals. Okay. Actually a lot, probably 90%. So 90%, okay. What is the average size of engagement if it, we're talking about the size of a one project, could be a logo, a brochure, anything that you do, dollar-wise, what's the average size? Average would be about 800 to 1,000. Okay. Is that what you want to charge or is that just what they can afford? I would like to charge more, but that's what like they how can much afford. More? How much more? Yeah. Well, for projects, I would like to charge a lot more because I feel like those tinier projects are what, eat, are what eats up most of my time. Okay. So I feel good about where my branding, my logo pricing is at, which is around 5000 to 6000 Uh-huh. But those smaller projects that are coming in come in anywhere from like 200 to 600 or 800 Okay, that then puts you at your average of between 800 right. to 1,000. So those projects are bringing down my average. So why do you agree to accept them? Because I need the money. How badly do you need the money? When you say you need the money, I just need to clarify that. I mean, everybody need. I need to be famous. I need to be a superstar. I need to be dating somebody amazing. That's really a want. Sure. So do you have some kind of financial um, need? that is driving that decision to take on work that is a lot less? Well, I have agreed with myself to give myself a paycheck, a certain amount, so that I can count on that to pay my bills. And so there is a certain number that I am trying to meet. How much is that number? 1750 every two weeks after taxes. No, okay, 1750 every two weeks. So that's uh, $3,000 a month after tax? Right, after tax and... No, that's more than 3000 right? It's 3500 3, 3500 yeah, sorry. Uh, my math is not good this morning, you guys. So 3.5K after taxes. So what is it before tax? This is too complicated for me. I, I need to know what your gross revenue needs to be okay. every single month. What would that then be? Then I need to bring up my spreadsheet. My gross should be double that, or at around six thousand, if I'm bringing in. Because I about save six. extra. It's not quite fifty percent tax yet, is it? No, but I I try and save extra for business expenses too. So that okay, that let's 3, just say seven 000. then. You want to say seven? Sure. All right. So you have to gross seven thousand dollars a month mm -hmm. to run your business, mm -hmm. without it feeling like oh my gosh. I'm eating into savings, I'm not making the rent or whatever it is you're making, right. okay? And you're a dual family income, right? So this is just your contribution to your family. Right. Now, it's an expensive thing to live in California, we know that. So some of you guys that are watching saying, 7,000 bucks is more than I make in a year. Let's just put it in context, you guys. It costs a lot to live here. We don't wanna get into all that in terms of the rent. The, the single biggest uh, thing that you're gonna be paying out is probably rent. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. That's your single largest living expense. So 7000 Okay, so let's do a little bit of math. Mm -hmm. For these logo jobs, let's say it's 5500 It's a weird number, so you're going to have to do the math for me. How many hours are you putting into doing that? Um, I put in normally... Hold on. We're probably losing I'll half the audience on. right now because we're doing a lot of math. But guys, stick with me. You'll see why we're talking about this, okay? We, we gotta get into the business of design. And part of that is knowing your numbers. 
Um, 36 to 40 hours are what I'm averaging on these branding jobs. Okay, you know what that average is? Just give me one number. 40 hours. 40 hours. So do the math and how much are you getting paid per hour? 137.50. So 137.50, perfect. An hour. Yes. Okay. Have you ever calculated this before? Oh yeah, I have a you have. sheet for all my brand. So you know clients. this? Yeah. Okay. I just don't have it pulled up right now. Okay, that's yeah. fine. And then when you do this other work that is in the lower tier, what are you yeah. working for in terms of an hour? Um, I usually don't charge per hour, but if I do, No, but you, forget about you no. charging an hour. Right. If the project's $500 and you spend 10 hours on it, that's what you're effectively getting paid. Not yeah. what they're paying you, but that's, you know, that's the rate that you're working at. So we need to figure that out. So let's take an average, one of these lower tier referrals mm -hmm. that's not a local branding job, mm -hmm. and they're gonna pay you $500 or 700 or 800, whatever you wanna say it's going to be. Okay. How long does it take for you to typically produce that work? Um, I usually break it down to $100 an hour. So you're doing it for it's rough. eight it hours? Roughly goes into eight hours, maybe less. It's probably it less. Go, it wouldn't go over eight hours. Oh, okay. I see. All right. So are we going to say it's about $100 an hour? Yeah. Okay. Are you sure about this? Something, is, my spider sense is going off. Yeah. You're saying that it takes you significantly less time to do the lower budget jobs, but it also you could do it faster and so it works out just fine. Right. I thought it'd be a more dramatic difference, to be honest. There are, but I do have one client in particular I'm doing production work on, which is $75 an hour, and it's on-call basis, which I need to update <laughs> that relationship because that's also breaking into my, it's task switching a lot. Yeah, and so it's hard I'm to losing do that. a lot of mental energy and time when I'm task switching on that too. Okay, so in order for us to get a really clear picture as to what's going on here, you are working at a lot of different rates. When you're working at your highest rate, which is $137.50, you're doing really well for yourself. Mm -hmm. And when you're doing production work, it's 75 bucks an hour. And that's not bad per se, mm -hmm. that's, that's actually pretty good. Except for the thing that we're not taking into account is the time it takes you to get back into the work, to find the files, to kind of recover your steps and say, okay, mm -hmm. I'm back in it and now I begin work and then the time it takes you to get out of that project into the next thing. Mm -hmm. So there's such thing that is billable hours and then you look at, wow, I can only bill for four hours today, mm -hmm. but it's now nine o'clock at night. What have I done? What is going on? What happened to the time, mm -hmm. okay? And so the first thing that you're gonna need to realize is when you do work at a rate that is effectively almost half of your normal rate, this is what you're costing yourself and your company. And I want you to start thinking about your company now, mm -hmm. okay? Now, a couple things we want to think about. So you, the initial question is, how do I deal with new business? And if you don't deal with new business, uh, you're, you're not gonna have a company for very long. That's the single most important part of what you're doing. You work really hard, you do really good work in hopes that somebody will call you. And when they do call you, you have to bring your A game and you have to give them your full attention. So a couple of things right now that I'm seeing immediately, okay? My first, um, action item for you is to get some help. And I also think that if you realistically are working 40 hours a week, I'm just going to be real with you right now, it's not enough. 40 hours a week is what you do at a desk job somewhere, clocking in and clocking out. That's the full-time gig and that's why people work a full-time gig because their hours are more manageable. Mm -hmm. It's a fallacy to think that people can go start their own business and work the same or less hours. That's not the case because now you're your own boss and you need to be doing the jobs of three people. Mm -hmm. The person who does the work, the person who does, the, who does admin, client relationship things, and then doing sales and marketing. Mm -hmm. and so effectively, like I've not worked a 40 hour a week, maybe ever since I started my own company. The hours are somewhere between 60 to 80 or something crazy like that, mm -hmm. okay, even more. And so some of you guys are sitting there thinking, okay, now I'm a workaholic, I'm advocating an unhealthy lifestyle. 
I'm just a realist, you guys. I'm just trying to tell you what it takes to start a business. Like, let's not pile this upon a facade of fantasies and wishes and hopes and dreams. It's a lot of work. It's it's the grind life, and nobody's joking about that. Okay, it does take a lot of work. So this is when people. The way I always said this is like when you're sleeping, dreaming, and thinking about breakfast. I'm sitting there grinding, hustling, doing new business development, writing content, and it will separate the two of us really quickly. Work in, work out, okay? I don't mean to say that you should try to destroy your life and not have a personal relationship, but just to be a realist about that. So the first thing is, I'm not sure you're working enough, and two, you need to get some help. You need to get some help. So when you feel like, I'm going to burn out, that's the time you start to think, I need some help. Okay. Right, and I have a question based off that. Yes. Because I do outsource, not a ton, because and what's stopping me is the project management time. That explaining the project to someone new sometimes takes more time and eats up more time than it's worth, and so that too is a hard transition going from doing it all myself to then taking the time to explain it to someone else and manage that relationship then between them and me and the client. Okay, you're not alone in this. Every entrepreneur, every business owner has had the same exact dilemma. I'm really good at what I do. I'm very efficient. So giving it to somebody else who A, is not going to work at the same level, and you have to accept that. They're never going to be at the same level. But to take the time to explain it to them, to develop a process, it needs up more time. Mm -hmm. But it's something that you're going to have to do. You just have to accept it and figure out an optimal way of doing it. Okay. Mm -hmm. If you're working with a revolving roster of designers and people like that, that's going to be tough. It's good to identify people that you like working with, that that do great work and that are easy to talk to and take direction really well and start to kind of say, here are my two or three people, my go-to people, and I want to develop a relationship with them. Mm -hmm. Okay, I want to give them steady work so they don't have to go and look for work from somebody else. Because if I don't give them enough work, Inevitably, they have to work for somebody else, and then they won't be available when you need them. Okay? I've already had that happen too. It happens. <laughs> this is like welcome to running a business. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you want to delegate. So you want to develop systems that you have in place where it requires over time less and less effort for you to job it out mm -hmm. to a certain point that you're just going to bring the person in house. Can you describe a system that I could put in place right now? Well, let's talk about what you're doing now. How are you sending out the work to them? Do you have shared file structures? Do you talk to them via Skype? Do you record a video explaining the project? How do you get assets to them, et cetera? Uh, currently, it's all through email. And then if I'm file sharing, most likely it's through Dropbox or I have uh, Trello, that the project management system that sure. I share with them and track the project that way. Okay. But if it's something really fast and I need them fast, I'll just shoot them an email and attach what I need and be like, hey, this is what it is, or copy and paste the email from the client, explain, you know, put in my description, my explanation, and then attach what I need to. Okay. So I will share with you what has worked for me. And then you, you sit there and think about what's going to work for you. We're using the same tools for sure. Mm -hmm. There isn't some kind of fancy tool or secret service that I'm using. Essentially, my night ends with me writing up what I need the team to do the next day. Mm -hmm. And so we're talking about the work you have to do after work. Okay, So I sit there and I really try to be as clear and to use as few words as possible to describe what it is that I'm looking for. Or if I have references, I'll put it together. I'll create a document. I want to be very clear and thorough about this. Mm -hmm. And a tip that you can do that I haven't done is to record you talking about the notes. Because mm -hmm. the way you say it, maybe you fill in some of the gaps, but all the bullet point stuff is already there, and you send them that video. So it'll be there in their inbox at the beginning of their day, no matter where they're at in the world. If they're in the same time zone, that'll be at 9 or 10 a.m., and then they can get to work. Give them all the assets, and you can link everything through Trello if you want. You create a ticket, and that's usually when I put in the notes there and any assets and I link it all into Dropbox so it's one little thing and I, then I can have visibility on where it's at. So if you guys haven't used Trello before, Trello is a great software, piece of software that allows you to manage and track 
cards. Essentially, you create different vertical columns, right? Mm -hmm. And the columns could be uh, need to do, I'm doing, for review, and done. And so they can move the cards back and forth. So let's say I need three logo ideas for this client. And you put it in there and you tag the person. And then when they're ready, they move it to I'm doing it. Mm -hmm. And they work on it for a while. So you like to see things move from the to do to doing. And then you, you love to see then from doing to review. And then when you write notes to it, you put it back to to do. Mm -hmm. And then they keep moving these cards back and forth and you can manage a pretty large team this way. Okay, and then they can ping each other and they can talk to each other. Is that how you're using Trello today? Yes, more or less. It's very close to that. Okay, yeah. so you're, you're good on that front. Yes. So I think the thing that I think we're assuming is it's just going to be magic that I can then just download my brain to somebody. Yeah. It but the takes recording, time. I think the recording, that's an idea that I have not tried at all because typing and describing what I want takes so much longer than just speaking it, like if I was to talk with a person or yeah. hopping on a Skype call too. So mm -hmm. I think that would help uh, maximize my time. There are a lot of tools and resources out there that allow you to record, but let's say you don't want to spend money, you can just use QuickTime. Mm -hmm. You can screen capture via QuickTime. It's totally free. You can speak into it. Another function that people don't know too much about is inside Keynote, Let's say you, all your bullet points and the images that you want to reference are already there. Mm -hmm. You can rehearse and record the audio and then export the file with audio annotations attached to it. Done. Wow. And that's yeah. a super clean system. And you can even edit it if you want. It's not a great editor, but that's what you can do. Okay? So that you helps. go into rehearse mode, you speak into it, and you step through the slides. It syncs up the voice with where you're at in terms of the slides. And you can export it as a QuickTime movie, upload it, and be done. That helps. Okay. So let's get back into it. Yes. How do you feel about me saying you need to work longer? Well, now I feel like I'd, my 40 hours, I feel like I do work a ton more. And so maybe my 40 hours was under averaging how much I work. You sandbagged the estimate? Yeah. Okay. All right. That's fair. So what time do you get up to work and what time do you go to bed typically? What time do I get up? I probably get up at 7.30. Okay, and what time are you ready to work though? Nine. So we're gonna call it nine. So that's you getting ready, working out, getting breakfast, getting your game face on, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And what time are you going to bed? Uh, what time will you stop working? Uh, average, probably 7 p.m. Well, that sounds kind of like a 40 hour work week to me. So don't try and drag yourself back in there. Yeah, so nine, nine to you're seven. Probably right. Huh? No, you're it is. Right. Well, if that's what you're saying. Nine to seven. So yeah. maybe in your mind, it's like I work really, really hard. So my day usually begins at seven a.m. Mm -hmm. and I'm working from seven a.m. and I'll tell you how I do it. But this will be insane. Okay. I, my day usually begins at seven a.m. and it usually winds up around one to two a.m. that I'm going to bed. Jeez. That is my day. Okay. Now, not all of my day, actually very little of my day is actually making stuff. So I'm mostly in the management, supervising, writing, content creation process. So the first thing I do usually after I wake up is I sit there for about 10 minutes and I just think about what it is I want to, to do today. Mm -hmm. And then right from there, I jump straight into social media and I start answering questions. And that takes me about an hour to go through. Mm -hmm. The reason why I do that is because the content ideas come from the people. So I'm listening, and something that I've talked about before, which is social listening, this is what I'm talking about. I'm answering questions, and somebody had a question. So somebody said, Chris, how did you learn all your keyboard shortcuts, especially when it comes to type? Is there a resource somewhere? And I don't know. I haven't searched for one, but it gave me an idea. I will create a guide, mm -hmm. a PDF, that I will share with everybody for free on how to quickly adjust your type. So that's a content idea. So I'm listening, and my thing is about giving people what they ask for, okay? And so I'm going to grind through the whole day. And depending on what day it is, I might spend more time at home writing, reading, researching, getting decks together, or doing something like that, or I'll come in and check in with the team. And my day just keeps going like that. When I'm driving, I'm usually, I'm usually calling people that are in my network to check in with them to see how they're doing, business-wise, personal, just checking in on. So my day is just working most of the time. Okay. Question based off of your day. Yeah. How do you stay so focused? Because that's one issue. That's a big issue with me yes. is the task switching 
and not being able then to focus. How do you focus on each of those things okay. and give your full attention to them? This is how you stay focused. Not the piece of paper, but what you write on it, okay? It, during the day, you're gonna get pulled a hundred different directions and everything's gonna seem equally important mm -hmm. to you. And I fall victim to this all the time. Just so if you guys were to spy on me, you're like, dude, he's not doing what he's saying he's doing. And I find that there are days when I'm, I'm scattered and I feel a little stressed out. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure why I'm getting that weird feeling in my gut. It's because I don't have a focus sheet. So the focus sheet is just you writing down what you're supposed to get done that day. It's not that important that you finish every single thing on the list. Maybe it's not possible. However, remember when I said when you wake up, you think about what you need to do, okay? Mm -hmm. So the first thing on my list today is to do a keyboard shortcut guide. Uh, I have a video idea on how to, do, to use a burrito as a metaphor, so I'm gonna do that. I wanna make a video on visual storytelling and using B-roll. I want to do a golden racial drawing, like just with hand, my hand and tools and compass and things like that. I want to show somebody how to do a vector stipple effect. So I'm going to do that. I want to do a Fields Note collaboration with Mr. Aaron Droplin, so I've got to shoot him an email. I want to show people how we light our set. So these are just ideas, things that I would like to get done today. Now this gets compiled or piled on top of the list of things I didn't do yesterday, mm -hmm. and so these things allow me to focus. So when somebody sends you an email about something randomly about the weekend or something appears in my timeline, or not in my timeline, in my, e my email box about, oh, there's a sale for a new pair of shoes, I'm like, not now. I just mm -hmm. delete it or move on because that can take you down another path. Mm -hmm. You go into the shoe site and 30 minutes later, like, what am I doing here? I didn't want to buy these shoes and it's already in my cart. What happened? You know, you get that shopping blackout thing. All right. So, Focus with a piece of paper and constantly update it every single day, okay? Don't make a list about what you're gonna do for the next year, just what do you need to do today? And at the end of the week, review what you need to do for the next week. So you have big goals that are chopped up into medium goals, to small goals, and to hourly goals, and now you know what you need to do. Okay, so <clears throat> this then ties back in with the original question about getting clients yep. and handling the incoming calls with them. So then how do you get that done while handling the newer, in the newer clients that are calling while, well, I guess we've hit upon the current work because I can outsource, so we got that handled. But now handling, focusing on that sheet and handling the new business coming in. Yeah, okay. You cannot make more time in the day. It's 24 hours every single day. What you can do is to spend more of that time working and the time that you're working to be more optimized and focused, right? So right. We've, we've taken care of a bunch of those problems. One is we expand our day a little bit. You don't have to go from an eight hour day to a 12 hour day, you can just add one or two more hours to your day. Mm -hmm. Let's say now you're gonna work a 50 hour work week, which doesn't sound like a lot from where you're at and it's more manageable. So like say now you have an extra two hours to do something every single day. Mm -hmm. Some of this you're gonna send out to other people. So you're, you're clearing the deck so to speak so that you can spend the time to work on the business of your business, and that's really important, all right? So now let's talk about the clients. Yes. Okay. When clients come calling, responsiveness is really important. Mm -hmm. You need to understand that. What I mean by responsiveness, I mean, from the time in which they send you an email, how long does it take for you to reply, okay? And that's very important because a client's going to think, I'm gonna give you good money to help me solve a problem, but I don't wanna be calling you three times a week asking like, where's the project, what are we doing, et cetera, mm -hmm. okay? So you wanna be very responsive. So now the question is, you need to build a better gate to keep out people mm -hmm. who are not qualified to be working with you, right. okay? So let's talk about that real fast. We need to bring the subject of money up front and quickly. So we're gonna do a really quick role play with each other, okay? okay? Um, I think I'm going to be you. Okay. And you could be your client because I don't really don't know your client. Okay. Let's say this is one of those referral clients that it's just kind of slumming it a little bit. The, okay. the budgets are too low. All right. All right. So, hey, Melinda, thanks for calling me. What do you got going on? Uh, well, I want you to work on a logo for me. Okay, great. Uh, tell me a little bit more about what you're trying to do with the logo. Well, it's for my new business that I'm starting. I'm an online entrepreneur and I need a logo for my site and for my business. Okay, so for logo work, we typically charge somewhere between 
five to eight thousand dollars. Is that something that's within your budget? No, not at all. What do you have? Two hundred dollars. Two hundred dollars. Yikes, <laughs> Linda! I can't do work for two hundred dollars. <laughs> There's probably a site somewhere that you can find. Now, I know Mary's our mutual friend, and there was a time in my life when I did work for that, but I can't sustain myself. You know, we live in California. You know how that is. I can't do work for that. I'm trying to run a business, and so I do appreciate you calling me, and unless you can significantly raise your budget, and we can talk about that. Otherwise, I, I don't even know who I can refer this to, but maybe there's somebody in my network that I can refer you to. How does that sound? That's great. Can you shoot me over those names? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks very much. Have a great day. All right, thanks. Say hi to Mary for me. <laughs> we'll do. And then we're out. Okay, so that's a two-minute kiss-off. Mm -hmm. Is that does that feel comfortable for you? Yeah. Is that what you're doing today? Um, so with some, I've after watching most of your videos, yes, I've been working on talking about money up front. Okay. Instead of writing up, say, a proposal, which in my words, a proposal is a bit. just yeah, but it's not. Like when I heard you talking about a proposal, you were talking about testimonials and case studies. Mine's very down and dirty, like scope of work, these are the goals, timeline, and price. Um, and so sometimes when someone comes to me, instead of starting out with those questions in the call, then I would be like, okay, well, I got all the information I need on the project, and then I would write up a proposal. Right. Okay. Blair ends talks about this in the Win Without Pitching Manifesto. He says, you know, I'm not in the bid building business, I'm in the creative service business, and I'm not going to build a bid unless I know the budget and that we have agreement on scope. Mm -hmm. There's no point. So just, you can just say that. You can say that maybe not like that, but you can say it like, you know, before I go and make a bid and spend all this time and energy trying to figure out your project, I just need to know what kind of ballpark are we in in terms of the budget that you have set aside to do this? What do you have to spend? Okay. And so it's like, you know, let me, let me give you a little story, you guys. People like stories. Let's say that you and your husband are planning a trip, a vacation, and he says, you know, Melinda, let's go on vacation, honey. Let's, you work way too hard. Those 40 hours a week are just totally killing you. I can see it. Let's take a break. Why don't you plan some place to go and let's go. And you go, okay. So you go through uh, travel sites and whatever those sites are. And you're like, we're going to go to Tahiti, baby. I think we deserve this. Let's take three weeks off. And Tahiti, I was talking about Temecula or some Torrance. Uh, what are you talking about? We have $300 to go and have a nice lunch. You're like, oh, but I spent all that time in doing research and I wrote, you know, I had the, like the hotel was picked. It's just, it was the, the, the cutest little cottage we we're going to stay in. We just wasted a lot of time. Let's try to have an understanding of what done looks like to rein this thing in. I don't know, creative people, we're very optimistic. The world's our oyster, everything's gonna be great and the clients love me and they're gonna spend so much money on this project. Well, welcome back to reality. Take off the happy ears, put those things down and listen for the things that are really there and just don't be afraid to ask. Now, I'm gonna ask you this question. Why were you hesitant, reluctant to just ask about the money. What was it? Was it something that was kind of like, is it crass? Like why wouldn't you just ask them about the budget? I think because I'm afraid, not necessarily currently, because I feel that I've grown a lot since I wasn't asking for money on the phone or about price. But during that time that I was scared to talk about it, it was that I didn't want to hear the word no and so if I came to them and said, hey, we charge between five and $8,000, and then their reaction is no, and I was afraid to hear that. Would you rather hear no after doing all that work, putting hours into the budget and the estimate and the timeline, writing just a beautiful scope of work document, then they're like no and crickets are chirping? It's an easier no to take. Why? That's insane because, to me. Because talking, and I'm saying this that I've definitely grown since then, so I can handle it yeah. much more now. Yeah. But at that time, I think just not hearing back from them or just getting an email back is less of a confrontation. Oh, hold on, hold on, hold on. Now you're saying this is confrontational. Well, depending on what your definition of confrontation is. Well, tell me what your definition of confrontation. You're the one who used the word. I. I Any time that there could be a no in there, I consider a confrontation, which that's not what. Will you drive me later today to the airport? No. 
You're being so confrontational. <laughs> well, I knew you set me up. Yeah, but that's what but you're yet, saying. Like, to hear yes, no is a confrontation. I, no, it's not. I used to think that, though. I used to think that a no, because I was a major people pleaser. And so I, I would, too, I would it avoid or not. saying no or hearing no. Yeah. And so if. if You'll do anything just, to avoid a no. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Used to. But you know who you're saying no to? Myself. You are. Yeah. And that's okay? No. And if you uh, one day raise a child and have a kid and they're going to go through the same process, what kind of advice would you give to that child when dealing with confrontation about doing everything to avoid no? What would you say to them? Could you imagine that? Let's just say you have a daughter and she's 22 years old, just graduated from school, is getting on with her life, has started a design practice and she's talking to clients and she's telling you, mom, these clients just can't afford what I do and then I do all these budgets and it just doesn't go anywhere. What would you say to her? Can you rephrase that question again? Yeah. Sorry, you're thinking about yeah. your daughter, you're imagining your daughter. <laughs> yeah. That would be lost in my nice, right? <laughs> Okay, you have a 22-year-old daughter and right. she started design practice, not unlike what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And she's running into the same problem as you. Mm -hmm. What kind of advice would you give to your daughter when it comes to talking about the money? What would you say to her? To talk about it quickly and up front. But why would you say it? Mom, I, I, don't, I don't like hearing no. Well, it's easier for me as a person not involved in the situation to just tell her, it's easy to say no, just tell them no. And what do you think her hang up would be? How could you say it to her that she could hear it? That the no does not reflect anything on her personally. But it feels like I'm getting rejected, Mom. But it may feel like that, but you're not actually getting rejected. What's happening then? The price is getting rejected. Oh. Am I charging too much money then? Should I just take it because I need the money? No. That's where I. That's where I still struggle. That if well, I help me really out, mom. Did... Mom, you're breaking character. <laughs> Dang it. Stay Back in character. Mom. mom. Well, the better jobs. You, if you say no to the smaller ones that can't afford Look you. Look right into the camera and say this, if, okay? If you say no to the ones that can't afford you, you're making room for the ones that can. Say that one more time. If you say no to the smaller jobs, the ones that can't afford you, then you're making room for those that can. Afford you. Afford you. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Can you hear that? Yeah. What's, why, why the hesitation? Because the immediate need is larger sometimes. The need to make that certain amount, that dollar amount, seems more real than that the belief that the larger jobs will come because I don't see them. I don't see them currently. Okay. Without getting too deep into your personal history, did you grow up in a middle class, upper middle class, lower middle class? Where, how, where did you grow up in terms of socioeconomic status? Um, upper to middle class. Okay, so you're a person who's used to having things and things taken care of for you. Yes. So you don't know what it's like to scrape. No. All right. I do. Okay? I really do. When, when we came to this country and I'm a first generation, somebody corrected me, I said, I'm a first generation American. They're like, no, you're not. You're a first generation immigrant. I was not born in the United States, having um, escaped communism and coming to America. We didn't have much, and we haven't had much, and we've worked with a very kind of immigrant mentality. Don't waste, don't spend, just work hard and save your money. And I always looked at it like, like this. When I graduated school, my parents did the best that they could to help me, but I owed a lot of money in loans. My credit cards were maxed out. I'm talking about. I think two cards in excess of $5,000 each. And I was thinking, you know what? My whole mentality has been, I come from nothing. I will go back to nothing. I'm comfortable in nothingness. I'm not used to any of this stuff. So if one day I'm making money, it's like, I don't care. It's here and it's gone. It doesn't really matter to me. So the power that money has over me is not whatever it is I give it. Mm -hmm. So I give it no power over me. I always think, you know, and, and I like to think, somebody's like, you're a really courageous person, Chris. You're a risk taker. You do all these things. And I say, well, thank you very much for saying that, but I am not a risk taker. I am not a courageous person. Courage is taking action when you know the odds are against you, mm -hmm. right? To show courage, like to fight a bully that you know is going to kick your butt. Mm -hmm. 
that takes courage. To fight a kid who's much smaller than you that you're gonna squash, that takes no courage whatsoever. So the reason why I don't have courage is I've never seen it as there's a bully or that this was risky, that I have a lot to lose. Because I'm like, whatever. And I'm able to bet the farm on the business decisions we make at the office because in the back of my mind, I have a secret backup plan. And the backup plan is I'm going to go work for somebody else and let them deal with all the nonsense and get paid hundreds of thousands of dollars. And my life is easy, back to 40 hours a week and barbecue weekends. Mm -hmm. That's my backup plan. I've never had to even come close to executing the backup plan, but that's the mentality. So we need to change the mindset. You're looking at like, oh, you know, the apartment. It's like, you know what? I don't care. I've lived in apartments where people got shot outside the street. Okay, I've been there. These things have happened. And it doesn't matter to me. So the money has no power. To this day, I don't know what's in my bank account. I don't even really care. It's all a game. And I've talked to a friend of mine before when he was bidding on a project. He gave the money all this power over him. So he started to behave unlike himself. And this guy is a very good poker player. And when he plays poker, he does really well. Because you know why? He doesn't care if he wins or loses. And you can't have that attachment. When he's pushing chips into the table, it's nothing. Mm -hmm. And that's how you succeed at that. So you have to like release the power that money has over you and go ahead and say no to these other things. Because they're not really in your best interest, they're not moving you forward. Some of it is half of the rate that you're getting paid anyways. Mm -hmm. Why would you accept that? You're not half the person, you're not gonna do half the work. Your, your, your expenses are not gonna disappear by half. So just say no to that, and you're much better off working on developing your brand. Now there's one other thing I wanna talk about before we end this segment, okay? I said you have to do a better job of lifting up the gates. The gates is talk about money early and often, mm -hmm. and the other gate is to say it on your site. Now, there's many ways to interpret this, and I have to be careful here. I don't necessarily mean in a prescriptive way for you to go put on, we do brand identities for $7,000 on your site. I don't mean that. How do you bring up the gate? The way we bring up the gate is we show the kind of clients we work with. They are blue chip Fortune 500, Fortune 100 companies, and they're big brands that you've seen. The work is super glossy, so most people come to our site saying, I can't afford you. On the off chance that I can, I'm gonna call them, okay? So you need to put up work that starts to speak and feel like, I'm expensive, I'm worth it. I work with these big companies and this is how I operate. If you are that kind of company, then I'd like to work with you. There's a simple law of attraction, like attracts like. So when you start working with middle to upper end clients, the little clients, the little mom and pop shops that want you to do a $100 logo, they're gonna disappear because they're gonna say, she's not for us. I don't think we can afford her, Bobby. They're gonna move on mm -hmm. and you need to do that, okay? Now, some people will actually put on their site their entire process, what it costs, and because that's how they know to talk about money and it works really well for them too. So either option works. Okay, so either <coughs> put that break down the actual cost or show the types of clients in that range. Just raise the gate. Okay, um, you ever go to Barney's New York? Do you shop at Barney's? I've probably have been there once. Okay, I've been there a couple of times. And even when I had money, even when I had money, it's intimidating to go shop at Barney's. I don't know why. And like, well, I'm like, well, what's going on with me? I have money, I could buy whatever I want here. Hmm. It's expensive clothing. And why is it expensive? Well, you walk in, it's beautiful marble, there's a spiral staircase in the middle of the thing. Everybody looks really sharp. There's beautiful people walking around, brands and things that you've not seen and curated window displays and all this kind of stuff. And they haven't told me one thing with words, mm -hmm. but they told me everything with the brand experience. There's a valet guy, he's out front. Uh, the last time I went shopping where there's a valet guy, it was like never. And it's in Beverly Hills. So it's saying all these things to me. You can't afford this. Now, that's a little snooty, a little bit snooty, but not on purpose, I guess, and it's something that I imposed on myself, mm -hmm. right? So you, the entire brand experience can be designed to filter out certain kinds of clients. If you show a site with 100 logos, which some people do, literally just a grid of 100 logos, it looks like they're worth $20 to me. Mm -hmm. And so they will continue to get work for that price and if that works for them, more power to you. It's working. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't show work like that. I would show less work. 
I would spend more time developing case studies and showing each project in its best possible light so that it looks like it's really expensive and really thoughtful and intentional. That's what I'm going to do. All right. That's it for this segment, you guys. I know this is a lot for us to think about and talk about. We went all over the place, but let's try and sum this thing up. If you are a solopreneur and you're running a creative business, it doesn't really matter where you're at. You need to actually try to buy more time in a day, and you can do that. So let's recap really quickly. Can you recap for me, yeah. this co-host? What are the sure. top high-level things that you need to do to buy more time for your life? Well, add on more time to your day, even if it's just a little bit, an hour at least. Um, then outsource what you can. Say no to the little jobs that are eating up your time that you're getting paid half of what you should. And make sure money has no power over you. There's one other thing. Get focused in the day in which you're working. So your focus sheet, a to-do list for that day that you need to get done. And when things cross your path that don't help you achieve those things, don't do them, save them for later. Even if it gives you great pleasure, save it for later. So you have to be a really disciplined business owner now. All right, guys, thanks so much. I hope that you guys really enjoy this episode with Melinda. If so, we're gonna continue to make more. We've got a couple more ideas that we're gonna run by. So give it some time. I know this one got a little heady, but I'm hoping that it was helpful to you. See you guys next time.